Starring Out show. I saw you in 81 on the Mob Rules mm -hmm. tour. It was yeah. just amazing. It was. That was a that, with Vinny. That, with Vinny yeah. yeah. And that album is uh, holds a special place in my heart because uh, it helped fuel a lot of my rebellious youth. Oh, good. Yeah, good. it was really good. very good. Why don't we try that, Eric? Why yeah. Why try? Uh, um, like I told you last time, I mean, a lot of guys were listening to Journey. I mean, I liked Journey, too, at sure. the time. But I mean, you know, they were the guys getting the girls, and we didn't, we couldn't get the girls. We listened to Black Sabbath because we were angry. Because we know? couldn't get them either. <laughs> <laughs> we were angry, and songs like Neon Nights were that's just right. like, yeah, it's giving me power. That's so. right. That's exactly what that band always was, and that's what all the bands that have, you know, been in from from Sabbath onward have been that because that was such a great part of my life that a lot of that incorporated itself into what Dio became, uh, and uh, I think Dio always became this con this conglomeration of Sabbath. And rainbow. Yeah. It always became that because I insisted upon the strength of it, and also insisted upon the, the melody of it. And that's one of the things that always attracted Tony to me as a singer and as a writer, because he he loved musicality, and he wasn't getting it from any other source other than me. And that's why we had such a such a good rapport together. Mob Rules. There's a song in there I have to ask you about the sign of the Southern Cross. Mm -hmm. Well, the Southern Cross is a const you know is a part of a constellation that you see in uh, you know in, if, if you're in, in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, so the Southern Cross is actually the, sim the uh, one of the sim symbolic parts of Australia. So that's what, that was your inspiration. The flag. Yeah. Well, the, I just love the word uh -huh. the Southern Cross, and I thought, well, wow, Southern Cross, that's such a cool sound, and it's hey, this is Sabbath. Anything with a cross makes sense to me, you yeah. know, on Sabbath, and the Southern Cross, and people don't think about that. So it was just a wonderful, uh, once again, that alliteration that I like a lot, Southern, you know, just, just it worked for me. Uh, the last in line, those kind of things worked yeah. for me in, in, that, in that way. So it was just that, and then I, I just tried to put it into the words of it, of it having, not, not being just a star that you may see in the sky, but uh, meaning something because at a certain time, uh, in a certain time of, of, of a certain year, uh, you know, of a certain decade, of a certain century, then the Southern Cross, that sign of the Southern Cross would say to you, now it's time for humanity to rise up and be uh, productive and fruitful and good and not miserable like, you know, most things were back yeah. then. So it was, uh, it was only that, really. It was, and most of the songs I write tend to be uh, a song that allows you to make your judgment as to what it is. You know, no, I, don't, I try not to ever point well, to what people go. say run crazy well, with thoughts great. of like yeah. what it could be. Wow, gather all around the young ones. They exactly. will make us strong. Exactly. Like, exactly. What's well, that? Exactly. You know? Well, that's the whole point. It's what you think about that. But it that. made it fun. You know, right. it made the music fun. It made you use your imagination, Yeah, didn't it? it wasn't just about like, did it all for the nookie. I mean, that's, that's good right. too, that's but right. well, I mean, we know what it's that, about. That's other you know? bands. That's not yeah. what I've ever done in my life. I'm a much more serious person than that. Obviously, you know that I'm, you know, I'm not a fool. You know, I'm a college-educated person, and, and I've always taken that education and tried to apply it to what I think is, is, is and could be good music. I mean, I, I've never seen any sense in the people who dribble and drool at the side of their faces, you know, getting that kind of respect. I mean, maybe you only get that respect from someone who's going to go into an insane asylum, and I, that's not yeah, where I'm coming from. We live in different times, though. Exactly. I mean, exactly. And I travel in different circles than other people do. So that's just something I've exactly. always expected of myself and expected of the fans that I played for, whether it be Sabbath fans, especially Dio fans, who are the greatest fans on earth. They're the most gentle, wonderful, caring, intelligent people I've ever known. Um, you know, I've been in some bands where the fans we've had in those bands have been like miserable people who want to fight everyone all yeah. the time. And that's not where I come from. That's not my space of life. So in being able to write that way and let people that I, because I, right away, when I write a song, I think to myself, my audience who's going to listen to it are smart. I don't think, whoa, we're a bunch of idiots, so I can write any piece of crap for this. Because I think to myself, they're going to know what I'm saying. They're going to know whether it's crap and whether you're an idiot. So that's always been my goal, to write things that make people use their mind a little bit. You know, not everyone is brilliant and bright. Of course they're not. But, you know, I like to think that they at least have that capability. And maybe in some small way, I've been able to let, help them, maybe through just one song, go, oh, wow, that's a good idea, isn't it? And then they can go, duh, after that if they want to. <laughs> now, um, during the whole live evil thing, now, it's a, it was in the press, and, and it's in the history books now, um, that there was problems in the studio where people would go in there late at night and turn up vocals, turn up bass tracks, turn down vocals, turn, you know, turn down guitar, turn up guitar. I mean, that, that's all, it, it's all so wrong, you know, and nothing like that ever happened. What happened was this, that I, I believe that after that album, um, Tony and Geezer probably had some other agendas. Okay. Um, what they were, I never really asked even when we got back together again. But I know that they had other agendas, and there were, there were a lot of uh, 
A lot of drugs going on at that time. Oh, okay. Because I would within say you have to be band. kind of out of your mind and on drugs to break up such a great band. I would think so, yeah. Yeah. I, that's what it made no sense to me either. But we, you know, Vinny and I weren't that. We weren't drugged out. We, we didn't, don't, don't, don't do that. But, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of that going on in, in parts of the camp. So when we went to the studio to mix the live album, Live Evil, that's all we did was going to mix it. We turned up the first day and Tony and Geezer didn't. So we waited all day long. You know, we, we got there at like, I don't know, two o'clock in the afternoon, which was supposed to be the starting time. And at eight o'clock in the evening, no one was there. So we said, okay, we're going home. And we went home. And we came back the next day at two and there was no one there. And uh, we went home. We went the next day and two o'clock and no one was there. And we said, well, no one's here. I'm not going to just sit here like a fool. You don't panic about stuff like this. You don't panic, panic about don't anything. Go, Those guys, I'm just sick of this. I'm getting on the phone. Look it. Where are you guys? It's that, that doesn't make any sense. If someone wants to do that, what am I going to? I'm not going to talk them out of it. Obviously, we knew there was a problem. So at that point, I said to the engineer, "Excuse me, can we hear what, some of this stuff now?" I mean, so yeah. listen to it instead of just sitting here like a lump. So Vinny and I listened to it. We didn't turn anything up. We never. I never touched a knob and, at all. Even these days, after all the albums I produced, produced, I do not go in there and deal with the faders. That's the engineer's job. I don't want him to think I, he doesn't sing. You know, he's going to go in there and use my mic. Yeah. I'm not going to use your faders, man. I trust you what you do. I we never touched the it. thing. I wouldn't have been able to handle it with your composure. Well, we, we handled it pretty easily. I mean, it didn't matter to me. I mean, if it was going to end, it was going to end. I didn't want it to carry <laughs> on with bad feelings. Yeah. I mean, that could never be a band. So we would say, could we hear more of the drums? Could we hear more of the vocal? We weren't mixing it. We were just listening. We weren't yeah. mixing. Yeah. We don't mix until Tony and Geezer are there. We were supposed to mix it all together. So then um, the story got to Tony and Geezer that we were turning guitars down and voice, voices up and drums up and basses up and down or whatever it may have been and that was their excuse. So I got a call from Geezer and Geezer said, uh, you know, I don't, this, this doesn't seem to be working. I said, and, and that is what? It doesn't seem to be working? You're not turning up or are being there when you're not there? What is it isn't working? Well, it just doesn't seem to be working. So I think we should let Tony mix the album. I said, well, you, that's fine with me. If that's what you want to do, fine. But you realize that that means the end of this, don't you? He goes, yeah, well, I think it should be. Okay, fine. And that was it. And it was over, done, finished. Never talked to them one time again until 12 years later yeah. when we re Sorry got to hear about that, man. Uh, I mean, it just. Well, it was, it was I pretty hate hurtful. Those kind of phone calls. It was hurtful, but, you know, I mean, you know, we're strong. We, we dealt with it. You know, yeah. Wendy and I went, we've got each other. We've got our own, we've got our talent. We can deal with it. And we did. We just went, well, how should we do this? What band do you want to put together? And we did. So yeah. it's not a problem for me, never a problem. Now, you boldly go on to produce the first DL record, mm -hmm. which is, like you said, magic. Tell me about that experience. How exciting or scary was that for you? Well, it wasn't scary. It was a, it was a labor of love. It was so wonderful to, to play again with Jimmy for a start, um, to still play with Vinny, uh, and to have this, this other wonderful presence to come into our lives, Vivian Campbell, who was just such a magical guitar player. I mean, this kid was just, you know, born with that thing in his hand. I mean, he could just play like, a, like an angel. And there it was. There was this magical thing. It already happened. I'd already written Holy Diver and, uh, and Don't Talk to Strangers. So we had two wonderful songs to start with. And then we just went into the studio and wrote some more. And the ma it was, as I keep using that word, but it was very magical. It was correct. It was right. It was uh, why this band or that band at that time was so successful. Because everyone could feel in the grooves of vinyl in those days yeah. just how wonderful it was and just certainly how good everybody was in the band. And we really cared about each other. But like everything else, things change. Uh, but in, during that album, um, you know, I had more misgivings than anyone else did because I had probably had more, more to lose than anyone else did. It was more like Richie when he left Purple. Me, I left Sabbath, but I had a great career behind me. It wasn't just Sabbath, it was Rainbow and Sabbath. So I knew I could draw upon those experiences and certainly upon that success when it came time to play live, uh, which we eventually did. But I was a bit worried, well, if this doesn't succeed, then I failed at this project. But, you know, once it was released and once it did what it did, I just said, well, thank you, someone, whoever you may be, whatever, you know, whatever God you believe in may be. Um, and from there, it was, you know, the sky was the limit after that. Yeah, well, this, the, the Holy Diver album and your, and, your, and your solo career took you to new heights that were incredible, selling out Irvine Meadows. Mm -hmm. uh, and Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Twice. You got it. There you go. And, and the forum, five times. Right on.
And so, so I don't I mean, mean to brag, but I'll tell you, those are important landmarks to me. No, definitely. Really, very, so important, especially Madison Square Garden. I'm a New Yorker. When you can, when you can sell out Madison Square Garden, then you've achieved something. Because believe me, I can remember the time when I was just a, you know, I was going to say a little kid. I've always been a little, but a very, very young kid, you know, going to New York every week when I was 15 years old, trying to get songs for people to, that I could sing or trying to get a record deal and nobody wanted to know. And I would be stuck out in the waiting room while other people were going in and seeing the head of record companies and going to a window and looking out over, the, you know, from the 50th floor and saying, you know, someday you're going to be sorry you made me sit out in yeah. this waiting room. And you know what? Yeah. Playing Madison Square Garden and seeing up on that marquee, Dio sold out. Yeah. That meant, that meant when I saw that, I went, see, I told you. Yeah. And so that was very, very important to me. Right on. We all hunger for those moments in our lives. We do, we do. That yeah. was, you know, I don't hunger for that many moments in my life, but that was one of them that I did hunger for. The forum, I could have lived to die without that. It didn't really matter to me. I mean, it was wonderful to be able to do that kind of thing and to sell all, you know, the other places out. But the garden was important to me because, you know, if you can make it there, you make it anywhere. You got it. By '91, you can just briefly tell me uh, you rejoined Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Just briefly go through that. Well, we were contacted actually by uh, by Geezer and. Uh, we were playing in Minneapolis at the time, and uh, Geezer, Geezer's wife called, who has managed his, his career for a while, and said, you know, we'd like to come to the show. And, and you're not hating them by, that, by this time? I never hated all. anybody. You just, well, I mean, you don't hold grudges. No, I don't. No, I don't. Okay. No, I don't. I mean, why, what am I going to hate him for? I mean, look at what we did together. Yeah, I know. Why should I hate I'm him? I'm the same way. No, I only remember the good things we did together. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, when they said we want to come to the show in Minneapolis, they were living in St. Louis at the time, and we said one thing, sure, but bring your bass, because you're going to play that night. He went, okay. So? He didn't, he didn't bring a bass, but we had one for him yeah. there. And he came out and we played and we did Neon Nights and we did Heaven and Hell with Geezer. I mean, he was such a brilliant bass player anyway, and it was great to play with him. Um, and that night, uh, you know, we got loaded, me and Geezer, in the, in the bar. And he said, you know, Tony really would like to get back together again. And I said, you know, I'd love to do that too, because at that point, that Dio band was, you know, a difficult one for me, difficult one. I didn't like some of the people in the band, and I didn't like what we were doing with the band. So this was an opportunity to do something I felt uh, that we needed to do with Sabbath. We only did two albums in, this, in the studio, and one, that one live album. And I thought we had so much more to, to offer. And when we did uh, you know, Dehumanizer, I mean, to me, that'll always be one of my favorite albums. I think it's a magnificent album. I think it's an album that no one expected. They expected to hear Heaven and Hell again, and we gave them exactly the opposite. Because, you know, damn it, you don't do Heaven and Hell again. You can only do it once. Yeah. You can only do Holy Diver once. You can only do, you know, Rainbow Rising once. Um, so it was, it was something that needed to be done that fulfilled something more for me. And then, of course, if we carry on with it, it fell apart again one more time, you know, because of, because of monetary reasons again. You know, once yeah. again, it was how much money can we make and the hell with your feelings. So once again, it got down to uh, the, another one of the famous stories that I refused to be the opening act for Ozzy because our, this was a Sabbath show. Uh, we had already had a show we were going to play Long Beach and uh, someplace else here in, in L.A. And suddenly, after uh, uh, we had just come back from Iceland, I got a call saying, well, now it's been changed and the last two gigs you're going to be opening for Ozzy. And my reply was, no, I'm not. I won't do that. And so for almost all those two months of touring in America, they still believed that I was going to do that show. Okay. I kept telling them, no, I'm not going to do it. And two weeks before, Geezer said to me, you're really going to do the show, aren't you? And I said, Told you one, I'm going to tell you only one more time. I refuse to do it. How could you possibly do that to someone who is called your guitar player a homosexual? You know he's damn well not. You like that? You like being called that, do you? You know, I mean, people's sexual preference is their own sexual preference. It doesn't matter to me, but Tony's not that. And so that should have annoyed him for not being that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, maybe nothing annoyed Tony because maybe money was more important. But it annoyed me. This was my band, too. I'm in Sabbath, and I refuse to take that crap, let alone the horrible things that were said about me over and over and over again. So there was no reason on earth for me to have to show, as they put it in those days, respect to Ozzy. I don't respect you for a start, and I don't need to show you any respect, mate, and I won't. So, so that was the end of it. So you, you, uh, you don't have any respect for Ozzy at all? Have you, do, do no, you ever, really? You don't watch the Osbournes then? No, I don't. No, okay. no. You know, I mean, of course, I mean, I can't say I don't have respect for Ozzy. Let's face it, he was one of the guys in that band who created heavy metal music. You know, I mean, what more respect can I give him than that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ozzy was always a good friend of mine when I wasn't in Sabbath. 
but when I was, he's always been a miserable person. He's had nothing but bad things to say about me. And I've always said good things about us. Yeah, I've, I've always take, taken yeah. a high road about this. So as far as my having to give him respect for that, no, I don't, I don't, you don't deserve respect for me with a, the with a lack of respect that you've given to me. And it's not my job, after all the things I've done in my musical life, to have to get on my knees and show respect to you. When you can sing as well as I can, then I'll show you some respect. So I guess you never get any respect from me. That's just the way it goes. And as far as Ozzy's program goes, I find it a sin that they've taken this man whose legacy should be what he created with Black Sabbath, what heavy metal was because of Ozzy, and opened him up like a can of sardines and said, here you go, this is what you get now. I think it's sad. I don't believe that you know, this, this man is now uh, the father figure. I remember when uh, Father's Day came around and the polls went out and saying, well, one of the people we'd really like to be our father is Ozzy Osbourne. Well, fine. Guess what? Don't want you to be my dad. But as far as the other thing goes, I mean, I think it's terrible what they've done to him. But remember, we're talking about Sabbath and the money, money go around yeah, again, and yeah. they've done very well for it. I applaud him for doing what he wants to do. I've never had any problem with that whatsoever. But uh, to have to, uh, you know, give him a salute and say, you know, after all the things that have gone down, no, I, I mean, he doesn't deserve that for me. But I don't say bad things about him. Why should I? Why should I? It's not going to change my life or change his. Hey, only thing I know is, as a musician, I don't have a lot of peers. That may sound like a pat on my own back, but you know what? It's true. I don't have a lot of peers, and I'm, I'm going to take that, that credit for a change because all of my life I haven't taken that credit from being called a legend. I'll go, I'm not a legend. You know, I'm not dead, and I'm not a legend. You know, there are people who can do this as well as I can. You know, and year after year after year, I have to prove myself to be able to do it all the time. And having done it after all these years, you know what? I'm going to take some credit for it for a change. Well, I... And thank you, by the way, people, for giving me that, you know, that, that pat on the back. This is for your audience, you know, who have, who have allowed me to be this. But, you know, sometimes, you know, just, just you know, bowing down and saying, oh, I'm, you know, well, I'm no, you're so a, humble. It's, it's, you know, it gets a little, a little bit sickening after a while. It's a little different for you because, I mean, you're part of that community. You almost must remember, too, that having been in Black Sabbath and probably being the only other import, really important yeah, singer in that band, yeah, I agree. other than Ozzy, mm -hmm. you've got this great fan thing going on. I mean, the, you know, the first, uh, the first two weeks of, of the first Sabbath tour we did, you know, I mean, I spent my whole time looking at this. Yeah. That's, you know, I mean, that doesn't become very flattering after a while when you're no, trying to I do your job. It. And I'm holding it here for you because that's what it looks like. Now, multiply <laughs> that by two weeks and two, two hours every night. Not a lot of fun, is it? That's what I had to put but, up with. But as, and I did. as usual, you won out. Well, I did because the fans who appreciated me for what I was stayed and supported the band. And the people who loved Ozzy because of Ozzy hated me. See, my fans didn't hate Ozzy. His hated me. So having had to put up with that, you know, it's time to, you know, to tell you that what the truth is. You know, it's just, it was hard to deal with, but I came through it and I was able to uh, embrace a a whole generation of my own fans once again. The Sabbath is a wonderful thing to be in. I'm glad to be out of it. Cool. All right, let's get current now. Let's talk about the new CD, Killing the Dragon. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you say that the title track refers to those who perpetrate injustices and what the world is doing to stop them. Can you explain that? Well, I mean, you can take any situation you want to, really. I mean, terrorism is probably the, you know, the greatest injustice to humanity. What's happening in Israel is the greatest thing, the most horrible thing that's, that's happened. Certainly 9-11 is, uh, you know, I mean, we all know that for what it is, yeah. and of course it affects us as Americans, but how would you like to be living in Israel at this point? How would you like to know that if you went into Starbucks that you might, you know, lose your legs or your life? Yeah. I mean, this, it only happened once to us here. I mean, on, you know, on the 9-11 in the Pentagon. on a hourly basis over there. Yes, I mean, that's a, I mean, what kind of an existence is that, could that possibly be? So that's an injustice, an injustice against the... Uh, and I won't even give him the credit to call him a man. He's not even a human being, uh, a Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. I won't give him that kind of credit. Or Osama bin Laden, of course, or the, uh, uh, the extremist uh, Islamics who may believe what they believe. But you know what, guys? You're wrong. You're really, really wrong. Um, that kind of injustice. Or the injustice of, uh, uh, of a bad president or uh, of a bad king. Uh, and we still have kings, and some of them are bad. So those kind of injustices. Injustices against humanity. And humanity will always rise up and say, we've had enough of this and we're going to tear you down. So the dragon is just the analogy between those who perpetrate injustices upon people and the people, of course, those who rebel against injustice and always will win out at the end. Yeah, well, the, the, the funny thing is, is that the dragon is actually symbolic in the, in the book of Revelations as Satan, the great deceiver. Mm -hmm. 
So in a way, these are all great Satans that we have in our world right now that are trying to tear it down. True, but there are other examples of dragons that are wonderful. There are wonderful yeah, dragons. Like so Puff the Magic Dragon. Well, well, I, that's a yeah, song I grew cool. up with. Um, you know? Well, there's that. There, you know, there, are, there are other books been written about dragons. There's a great book called The Dragon and the George. You should read that sometime. It's just the coolest book on earth. And it's about a great It's about a guy who was sent back into another time uh, through some chicanery of some kind and found himself in the body of a dragon. He had to learn how to breathe fire. He kept you know, burning his fingers and burning his, his wings off. And uh, he was just a great dragon. So it depends on how, what, what kind of persona you give a dragon. Well, in this case, the dragon was meant to be somewhat the dragon uh, of the olden days. It would have to be given a child for a sacrifice or would take a child or a, uh, someone from the village and roast them and eat them. You know, we, we have, but we have both. There are good and bad and everything, just like there are good and bad human beings. So the dragon was not meant to be, for, for those who love dragons, as I do, it was not meant to be... Uh, a great big white, a blackwash, not a whitewash, uh -huh. that dragons are evil. No, because okay. to me, nothing is totally evil. Now, tell me about this song, Rock and Roll, that is also on the album. Well, that again pertains directly to the 9 11 tragedy. In fact, you'll hear me mention that tonight when we uh, introduce the song, because I think it's important that people know why we wrote the song. It's not about rock and roll. It's not, hey, rock and roll, hey, we're rock and roll. It's not that at all. <laughs> what it is is that at that time, following the tragedy, um, they started to censor some rock and roll music, music that had not even been written at that time, written way before the fact. In fact, some of it was mine and Dio, yeah. Kevin Sabbath, written well, well before the fact, because it was politically incorrect. Oh, excuse me, it had nothing to do with what you're talking about. Plus the fact that at that point, I knew that we were going to be sending thousands of our young men and women to a, a, a location thousands of miles away to die. Yeah. Oh, okay, you can go and die, but oh, by the way, we're taking your rock and roll away from you too. <laughs> Something that's so important to you, that makes you an American, that makes you remember your family, that makes you remember what you're fighting for. Wasn't this all about freedom? I thought it was, you know? But they're taking some of that away. So that annoyed me to such a point. And then in the middle of the song, I called them the song police. How could we possibly have song police? But we do, don't we? Yeah. So that was written about that, that whenever the times get bad like they did there, we scream out to our warriors and say to them, save us. But those same warriors were having a freedom taken away from them, yeah. and that was their music. And I know from the Gulf War, I had so many wonderful fans who would write to me, guys who were over there fighting. Man, every time we'd go out into the field, a lot of, well, got a good friend of mine who's a tank commander. When we'd go off into the desert, what do we blare through the speakers? The last in line, man, yeah. because that's, <laughs> a, you know? And, you think about it. Yeah. Not true. I mean, that's what I'd want to hear if I had to go out and die for someone. Yeah, if I was something running, pumped you up. If I was like, you know, one of those planes or something, I'd be sure. like doing the Neon Knights thing. Exactly. Da, 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 da. Exactly. But, uh, okay, so now let's get on a lighter note here. Huh? And what was your first impression of Tenacious D's song entitled Dio? Because I know you did the new music video with them. We'll get to that too. Well, I thought, you know, originally I hadn't heard it. And I, you know, different people had told me different things. You know, oh, they really slagged you off, man. Did they really? Oh, it's really good. Well, it's about you, and it's cool. Oh, okay, well, maybe I should judge myself. So I listened to it myself, and it was great. I thought it was cool. Yeah, and then when I got to mention him, I asked him about it. Yeah. You know, he went, oh, man, you know, we, you know, we meant it so cool because you know, we're such huge fans, especially Jack. And, uh, you know, I mean, I thought it was anyway, and they, they, they told me that it was. So I, I thought it was great. I'm passing the torch. I'll pass it to them anytime they want. And then when I'm the video, through with it. Yeah, well, how did the video come about now? Well, our, our, actually, the president of our record company was a, was a friend of, uh, of, I think, their manager okay. or someone that, who, that, that knew them very well. And he thought it might be just a really interesting idea because they had done the song that pertained to me. And so we asked him, they went, yeah, great. They did. It was great. So tell me a little bit about the video because I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Well, the song is for, it's for a song called Push, okay. which is on Killing the Dragon. And uh, they just busk in the beginning, have a guitar case open, playing on the streets, and they're doing the beginning of Heaven and Hell. And they've changed the lyrics. Jack changed the lyrics to... Sing me a song, you're a singer. Pass me the bong, you're a, a, you're a bring of reefer. The devil is never a maker, and someday I'll manage the Lakers. And uh, he said, well, I always mention the Lakers, because someday maybe they'll give me a ticket so I can, a place so I can sit next to Jack Nicholson in the good seats, because he's a huge Laker fan. And um, they were just incredible. And Jack is the most intense person I've ever met in my life. Yeah. He's like a Chris Fairley, just so incredibly intense. And I just had the time of my life not only meeting them, but doing it with them. And that, to me, they made that whole thing come together. I mean, the beginning and the end, just because they, were, they wanted to do it, and they worked so hard to do it. What is it like writing with Jimmy Bain again and working with him? Oh, it was wonderful. Him? It was wonderful. Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy's always... He, the best thing about Jimmy is that he has no down moments. 
Jimmy's always very, very positive. It's going to be oh. great. It's going to be great. Everything's oh. going to be. This is great. You need that. I love what you wrote. It's great. We did this. It's great. Everything's great. You do need that because there comes a time when, after all these years, you, you tend to doubt yourself at times. Gee, I hope this is okay. But the best attribute that Jimmy has is, is his positiveness. And the second one is he's a brilliant bass player. Probably the most underrated one I've oh, ever yeah. played with. He just, when Jimmy plays, it's there. Well, he just holds it together with just being there all the time. And it's not even what, you know, what he plays, it's how he plays yeah. it. It's always there. Yeah, and he's just been my friend for all these years. You know? What do you like of the current crop of music that's out there? Not a lot. Not too much. Don't really listen to a lot of it. Uh, I find too few great singers which is what bothers me the yeah. most. Um, and too few great guitar players. You don't hear the ilk of a Richie Blackmore or a Tony Iommi that much anymore as far as what they can play musically. Um, it's all how low can you tune the guitar and, uh, and maybe we can tune it down to a C tonight. That'll be great. One, it'll sound like this. That's what the singers sound like to me. Sure, there are a couple of good ones. Oh, the kid from Train's got a great voice. Um, oh yeah, the, he is good. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, they're they're a great band. stage presence. Yeah, they yeah. are good. Uh, Corn, good band. I like Corn, yeah. good band. Um, have you have you ever met any of those guys? John I know Monkey Davis, from Corn. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah, he he's seems a great to be guy. The most down to earth. I met him. Great before. guy, great guy. Um, the others, I'm, do I'm they give the, you props? Oh, absolutely. They go, Dude. All the time. Nickelback, sing. All those guys. You know, man, we grew up on you, man. Without, and it's it's amazing because all these years later, and here these bands are like you know Creed. Those guys are so you know they're really huge. Dio, yeah, and you know other bands, Priest, Dio, Maid, wow, great, yeah. and that's a wonderful, wonderful pat on the back for us, you know. So some of those people, you know, I listen to, but mainly I don't really hear a lot that I like because I don't hear it being played the way I think it should be done. I don't hear the great singers and I don't hear the great guitar players. There's some great drummers and great rhythm sections. That I'll give them. Some of these guys are oh, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I mean wow. they've taken it. Some of these people are taking it to the next level. They have. I mean, I, I, who would have thought, I mean, the seven, uh, like, monkey with the seven string guitar, mm -hmm. who would have ever thought about that? Well, you know, you got to lay a lot of that to Flea. I mean, there's, oh, there's a bass player for you. you know? Yeah. I mean, and, you know, he's influenced so many people just because he became suddenly this almost soloist bass player. But then again, who, who were some of his influences? Geezer Butler, because Geezer, one of the great yeah. bass players who ever played on earth. So, you know, I've just been lucky to play with some of those guys. So it's hard for me to, to think, well, let me compare them to the guys that I play with, the guys who actually created it all. Yeah, you know, exactly. To this day, they're all such The architects. Players. That's right. Yeah. That's right, the engineers. So now, what is next for Dio? Well, we, uh, you know, we, we will continue to tour. This is our last show for this wonderful tour that we've done with Scorps and Purple. We go to Europe on the 27th. We start, you know, in fact, we're doing the first seven shows with Purple again. Then we go off and do our own shows, Scandinavia, Spain, Italy, uh, Romania, um, Switzerland, you know, the usual places that we always play, France, uh, then off to uh, Russia, where we've been once before, uh, Russia to Japan, where we've been a million times, Japan to Korea, Korea to Malaysia. Wow. Uh, then back here again. There. Yeah, back here again, then we'll start our own tour, our own headline tour. Excuse me, a little ply. I hate uh, those things. Our own, a little, our own headline tour in November, and so it'll be November up until December. Uh, then in January, we'll probably get on to South America. And we'll probably stop uh, sometime in February, I would think. And um, probably have to all go to uh, you know, the, uh, some kind of health resort to get our health back again, if we can possibly do that. Actually, I was going to say, you look like you're in great health. I'm in good shape, yeah. I mean, most I'm of the rock shape. stars, you know, they get the gut and like, you know, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Sure I do. And, and it's just like, you look good. Well, I refuse to not look anything better than what people do expect. Do you work out? Like. I walk every day. I walk, you know, three or four miles a day. Uh, you know, I usually have, have a lot of animals, usually, and we walk them all the time, and that, that gives me great Well, what kind exercise. of animals do you have? Well, at the moment, I've only got a cat. My last dog died last, uh, on the last tour, and I refuse to, to let someone else bring up my animals, so I need to have the time off to do that. What kind of dog do you have? I was like? in Newfoundland. Oh, it was in Newfoundland? Yeah, about I'm twice really, as big as me. I'm really into pugs. Pugs, I've never had a pug. Uh, they're, I love them. They're, they're lovely little dogs. Yeah, yeah they lovely look, they're so handsome, especially no. you get those robust faces. Oh, yeah. To me, just... any dog is wonderful. Any, any animal is wonderful. They're so much better than human beings. Yeah, they're they only, love them. That's exactly right. I prefer big dogs, but I've, all, I've had, you know, from, uh, you know, I've had Dobermans, Newfoundlands, uh, Shepherds, Poodles. I had a Poodle that was the coolest dog that ever lived. This Poodle wasn't a Poodle. You know, it thought it was a Doberman, thought it was a Shepherd, thought it was a Newfoundland, thought it was everything because it had all these big dogs behind it all the time. And she was never cut like a poodle. She looked like me. The, the German Shepherd looked like Wendy and the poodle looked like me. It was all black curly hair. Like I say, never cut like that and had balls of iron, even wow. though it was a female. It was the greatest little dog. So it doesn't matter how big or small they are. 
because their dogs' hearts are, are bigger than the world anyway. Because all, like you say, unconditional love. I that's know. all they ask for. They, yeah, they don't deserve to be abused. Or no, they, well, no, they don't. It's, and it's so sad when that does happen. Yeah, but. I know. There's, there was uh, just real quick before we wrap this. So there was an instance. I was driving down the street one time, and there were some kids beating this dog with a stick. And you know, I was old enough to like be able to get out of the car and finally go, look at what do you, you know, get exactly. out of that's here. Right. You know, exactly. when I'm younger, I couldn't. A lot of times right. I didn't have that kind of power, but uh, that's right. anyways, Ronnie, Good it's been Eric, so thank you, great talking to you. Thanks, you are Eric. truly an awesome vocalist. Thank this you. is the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show with Ronnie James Dio, and we're signing off. Bye bye. See ya. The Blaring Out show.